Welcome back to your weekly Space News Recap. We once again have a ton of SpaceX Starship updates to cover, with big strides taken forward towards flight number 3. Falcon 9 launches from both the East and West Coasts, United Launch Alliance's maiden flight of the mighty Vulcan Centaur, Space Shuttle Endeavour is removed from public view, and much, much more. Let's jump in. Last week, we left things off at Starbase with both vehicles for Flight 3, that being Super Heavy Booster 10 and Starship 28, having conducted successful all-engine static fire tests, and Booster 10 had been removed from the orbital launch mount, awaiting return to the build area. Well, this has now happened. On Tuesday, the monstrous booster was rolled back to the production facility for final checkouts before launch. I love this footage from NASA Spaceflight. You can really see how much of a squeeze it was to get it back. I sure would be feeling pretty nervous if my car was parked there. A few days after the Booster 10 rollback, we then saw Ship 28 make its departure from the launch area, having completed two static fire tests during its time there. It too will now begin undergoing final preparations for its orbital flight. After completing its rollback, it was moved into the high bay. In addition to final pre-launch checkouts, SpaceX are still awaiting issuance of a launch license for Flight 3 from the FAA, who are still working on their mishap investigation into the failure of Flight 2. Ship 28 and Booster 10 weren't the only things removed from the launch area. With the new horizontal tank infrastructure in place, disassembly began on the old vertical tank farm. The first to go was one of the old water tanks. Here it is being lifted up for scrapping. After being placed at the roadside, workers began cutting it up with torches, captured here by Starship Gazer. I love the moment of separation. It wasn't long afterward that the second tank was removed. This time, one of the tanks originally designed to hold methane, though it was later repurposed as a water tank because it wouldn't have complied with Texas laws with methane storage. Oops. <laughs> with the orbital launch mount boosterless, SpaceX took the opportunity to run another test of the booster quick disconnect hood. This interface supplies the rocket with propellant and power, and when launch happens, it needs to rapidly detach and shield itself with the protective hood. As far as we can tell, no obvious damage occurred to it following Flight 2, but the internal flex hoses were removed and later replaced, so this test could well have been another in a series to ensure that all the replaced hardware is working seamlessly. Booster 12 was recently moved out of the Mega Bay and rolled down to Macy's for cryo testing, and now a Starship has joined it. Ship 30 was rolled out of the High Bay and transported down to the Macy's test facility as well. Here, you can see them both standing together, thanks to NASA Spaceflight's Sean Doherty. On the 4th of January, testing began for Ship 30 with a cryo test as you can see in this footage of the frost forming on its fuselage. Back at the build area, the new mega bay is basically complete now, and as such, the massive LR11000 crane was lowered. When in service, we believe this new mega bay will be used for ships, while the existing mega bay will remain for booster production. What's going to happen to the high bay, do you think? Will it continue service as a supplementary bay for mega bay 2, or will we see it demolished? Let me know what you think in the comments. SpaceX's Starship, always a buzz to discuss, but Falcon was once again hard at work launching payloads to orbit last week, and interesting payloads at that. To begin, on Wednesday, we actually saw two Falcon 9 launches. The first took place on the west coast at Vandenberg, where the Falcon 9 lifted off carrying 21 Starlink V2 satellites. But this was no ordinary Starlink V2 launch. Among the satellites, which you can see successfully deploying here, were six with direct-to-cell capability, or in other words, Starlink satellites that mobile phones can connect to directly, no dish required. In SpaceX's words, acting as a cell tower in space, allowing access to texting, calling, and browsing in what would normally be signal dead zones. So far, the only service provided will be texting for now, but as SpaceX grows the number of these satellites, more uses will become available. The launch went off successfully, and shortly after stage separation, Falcon 9's first stage made a successful propulsive landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You in the Pacific Ocean. The other Falcon 9 mission we saw on Wednesday took place on the East Coast at Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40. On board was a single Swedish communication satellite, which needed a full Falcon 9 to itself because it needed to get all the way to geosynchronous Earth orbit. The satellite, the Ovzon 3, is a broadband telecommunication satellite operated by Ovzon AB, and they've had a somewhat weird relationship with SpaceX up until now. The satellite was originally supposed to launch in 2020 aboard Falcon Heavy, but then later Ovzon 
announced they had ended their agreement with SpaceX and would instead use the Ariane 5. I wonder how much this had to do with incentives to use European-made rockets. Sadly, delays with the satellite's manufacturing meant that they eventually missed the boat to use Ariane 5 as the rocket reached retirement, so they went back to SpaceX, who of course launched the satellite on Falcon 9. The Falcon 9's first stage made a successful landing on Landing Zone 1 at the Cape, which made it double digits for this booster. B-1076 has now got 10 launches and landings under its fins. SpaceX also shared this great view of the second stage, performing a picturesque sunset burn on its way to high orbit. The third and final Falcon 9 launch of the week was on Sunday the 7th of January. Starlink Group 6-35 launched from Launch Complex 40 at the Cape, and the Falcon 9 carried 23 Starlink V2s to low Earth orbit. Here's the moment of fairing separation as the rocket second stage flew into an orbital sunset, while on the left the booster made its way back down to Earth. Shortly afterwards, the Falcon 9 first stage made a successful landing on the drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. I think the most exciting launch we saw, though, has to be the maiden flight of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur. This happened earlier today, actually, Monday the 8th of January. Designed to replace the Atlas and Delta IV Heavy, Vulcan is ULA's new orbital workhorse, and its first flight couldn't have gone better. It lifted off from Space Launch Complex 41 from Cape Canaveral, powered by two SRBs and, of course, two of Blue Origin's BE-4 engines. The rocket was carrying real payload, too. Astrobotics Peregrine 1 Lunar Lander, built as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. And it will not only be the first US soft lunar landing in 50 years, but also the first moon touchdown by a private firm. The spacecraft is now en route to the moon and will attempt its landing on the 23rd of February. In addition to Peregrine 1, the rocket also carried the cremated remains of several notable people associated with the original series of Star Trek, including creator Gene Roddenberry and Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura. In its six SRB configuration, Vulcan Centaur can carry 27.2 metric tons to low Earth orbit, which is almost as much as Delta IV Heavy. Whether or not we'll ever see a Vulcan Heavy remains to be seen. Unlikely, I'd say, but in late 2020, ULA did say it was looking into the potential for a three-core variant of Vulcan Centaur, so who knows. With a successful maiden flight, Vulcan is now the world's first methalox fueled rocket to reach orbit on its first launch attempt, and it's the first methalox fueled rocket to reach orbit from the United States. Hello, I was just about to render this video when I saw that Astrobotic has released a statement about the lander, that... After a successful launch, they have unfortunately encountered an anomaly, which prevented the lander from achieving a stable sun-pointing orientation. The team is working hard to address the issue. Hopefully they fix this and get the lander back on track. Space Shuttle Endeavour has enjoyed time in the public eye at the California Science Center in Los Angeles since October 2012, but after its 11-year stint, it's finally going off display. For now. Until now, it's been displayed raised up, as shown in this photo, but now NASA has even grander plans for it. The exhibit is getting revamped and will display the orbiter mounted in its launch position, just like here, while preparing for the STS-130 mission on the 6th of February 2010 at Pad 39A. And here is an artist's rendition of how it will look in its new display hall. Right now, the hall is under construction. Here's a photo from the LA Times of it right now. You can see the walls are going up and the SRBs are already in position. When completed, the building should look something like this. And while it's a shame that this all means that Endeavour will be out of display for a couple of years, the end result should definitely be worth it. I myself have had the pleasure of being able to see the Soviet Buran shuttle in the flesh, or at least the air test version since the actual orbital spacecraft was sadly destroyed when its hangar collapsed. I'd love the chance to see one of NASA's shuttles in real life as well. Endeavour's current hangar will be dismantled around it, and then the vehicle will be rolled out down State Drive to its new location, where it'll be lifted into place onto the external fuel tank, also yet to be installed, and then the rest of the museum will be built around it. I certainly wouldn't want to be at the helm of the logistics of this move, sounds like a very complex operation, but one that I'm sure will be worth it in the end. Lowen Aerospace had another busy week. I set out on a very ambitious mission. In order to investigate what the limits of the new tech tree is in KSB2, I decided to try and get all the way to ELU on my very first launch in exploration mode. So I only had access to the very, very small number of parts you get when you first start a save. Only the swivel engine, no batteries, no solar panels, and crucially, no heat shield either. If that sounds interesting to you, then it should, statistically speaking, be one of the video cards on screen alongside my amazing Patreon 
Patreon supporters, without whom none of this would be possible. If you want to see your name in lights there, then head on over using the link on screen or in the description. But otherwise, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.